So, uh, we're going to move into the final part of the day. Um, so, I'm going to relinquish um, my hold on the reins um, for, for a moment. We heard about the what, we heard about the why. Before I introduce um, your moderator for the how, how could and should citizens and civil society be involved in EU cohesion policy in the future? Can we just have a last look at that survey, which we're going to see, I think, come up as a graph. So, sorry, because you've got that on the screen, and we are going to hear from those good people in a moment. How should public authorities engage with citizens on how public money is spent? So, there we have at the bottom, for those who haven't been in before, grey is those of us live in the room. Brown is, in the last few days, um, around 10,000. I think we've got got to about 10,000 people across the EU uh, through their phones have taken part in these polls. So there you see the comparison. So a big, a big change there here, those of us in the room, that's what's really important. Big difference, citizen dialogue, town hall dialogue. Likewise, the consultations, the assemblies, and here, the social partners. Now, I don't know who, it could be that you all know the mechanisms, you all know the stakeholders better, perhaps that's also why you have, have the importance here, but interesting to see those differences. Um, any surprises, anybody? Has it been, is it interesting for you to see that, the comparison with your peers? Yeah? Okay, so that's citizens, and that, as we said, conference... So, there's a very, very strong for citizens' dialogue, downhall dialogue, face-to-face, -face, alongside the online. And we heard about the offline-online dynamic this morning from several of the speakers. So, thank you very much. Again, don't run away if you want to hear about the results in your country. Uh, these good gentlemen and lady who are on the stand just outside can help you with that. So, that's that for now. I now take great pleasure in ceding my place to the Director for Administrative Capacity Building and Programme Implementation 2 at DG Regio. Uh, Vittoria Aliata di Villafranca. She is going to moderate the final part of this event um, and I will hop up on stage to do a few thanks at the end. But if I might invite you to come forward, can you give her a warm welcome, please? Thank you so very much. Um, thank you, Katrina. Obviously, may I ask you one question? How have you enjoyed it? Because you have been here all day. So you know, you see the basis of what's been going on to, uh, to orchestrate this final discussion. Anything that really resonated, that struck you? That Something that struck me very much is that um, we can say that um, when it comes to citizens' engagement in cohesion policy, business as usual is not valid anymore. I think it was said in the morning, in the afternoon, even though we have some tools, we have the partnership, uh, the code of conduct, we have monitoring committees, but business as usual is not enough. The world has changed, Europe has changed in the world, and we have to do things differently. We have to jump forward, and I hope we will live up to the expectations that we have raised with this conference in the Yes, condition. I think that's a good, you've raised expectations. Okay, I will grab my notes, yeah. and I will leave you to it. Good, thank so you thank you very much, much Katrina. And see so you we start, so thank you very much, and we'll see her at the end again. Um, so as she said, we will start now the, the let's say, the, the final part of the conference. And um, in the morning and in the early afternoon, we've heard mainly about civil society organizations' experience with how do they engage with citizens, how do they, rather, how do they as citizens engage with public authorities, what do they think works better, so they gave us some examples. We also had a, a mayor from a city in Poland and we had the state secretary in uh, Norway that uh, told us something, but it was mainly about civil society organizations. Well, now we will, first we will hear to um, um, a mayor of a major city in Romania and a president of a, a region in Italy talking about their direct experience with engaging with citizens. And then we have here the institutions, some institutions, and we have a spe very special uh, guest as well, the European Ombudsman, but I will say something more about that later. Um, but here in this session now it is the response of those that have a responsibility when it comes to uh, local or regional um, uh, um, uh, governance, and then of the institution to see how can we react, what can be done to 
give a reply and to do things better and differently. But firstly, I would like then, so first of all, to remind you that the language regime has not changed. So we, uh, the speakers will be able to speak uh, either in English or in Italian or in French, and then you will be able to listen in also in these three languages. Um, let me start then. It's uh, a great pleasure for me uh, to invite to the floor for the first speech the mayor of uh, Cluj uh, Napoca, Mr. Emil Bock. Uh, Mr. Emil Bock, who so has been a, uh, the mayor of Cluj Napoca for many years, and um, before that he was um, the president of the Democratic Liberal Party, and that nominated him, supported him as prime minister in the late 2008 in Romania, and he's been serving as prime minister of his country for four years. You have the floor, Mayor. Thank you so much. Having in mind that I, I have just five minutes, I'll go straight to the point in order to, to save uh, uh, time. I'll try to present very briefly two small examples from my city in terms of democratic innovations at the local level. And I'm talking about, uh, um, so let me, where is the, should I use this, this button? This button. So I'm talking specifically about two case studies, two small examples of democratic innovation at the local level, participatory budgeting process first, and second, a center for innovation and civic imagination. Few things about uh, my city. It's based on four letters T, talents, tolerance, technology, and trust, everything in an inclusive manner. Everything is connecting with NGOs, universities, private sector, public administration, and citizens in a model of multiple helix. And what is the most important, eco, not ego, system approach in the context. You know what I mean. And um, now, these two case studies, participatory budgeting process. You are already experts. I heard all the morning, all the experiences. You know what does it mean. We try to offer to our citizens the possibility, the capacity to decide, not just one at four years, but to decide at least every year how some part of their money they should decide how to be spent. It. So we use three kinds of public participatory budgeting process. It, there was a traditional one, classic, which means ballots, meetings, and votes. The other one was for youth, the very first one in um, Central and Eastern Europe. And the last one was online participatory budgeting uh, process using the technology in order to have a uh, um, participatory budgeting process. Some examples from the very first uh, participant, classic one. And you can see here the results of that uh, uh, process. Here is the youth process and it was very successful to address to the young generation the capacity to propose projects, to finance them and to, to implement it. And that model became one of uh, uh, the, um, I would say in Europe, uh, best practices for the youth participatory budgeting process. And in terms of, um, of uh, online participatory budgeting process, we took in consideration that not everyone is acquainted with technology. So you did two things. First, we used our, um, young people to train the older generation how to use internet, how to use uh, uh, Wi-Fi, emails, uh, all the stuff, Facebook, in order to submit projects. And in the same time, we still offer to them a place to come and someone will write the project for them. But for the, the others, we also use the online participatory budgeting process. As you can see, there were more, uh, almost 80,000 people participated in, uh, in, uh, in this process of online participatory budgeting process because we want to have technology inclusive, not exclusive, in an exclusive manner. Results of implementing school buses project was implemented as a result of uh, participatory budgeting process. Um, art in the schoolyard, one other example, or contactless payment in public transport, they, they forced us to implement sooner than later this content and other uh, the new technology we, they, they saw in Western Europe in order to implement in the city. And uh, the other one, which is Center for Innovation and Creative, uh, Creative Center, it's a place where we are testing the ideas from citizens and from the public administration in a common place. It's very successful because it's a place where everybody can test their ideas. If everything is good, it's due to the mayor. If everything is bad, it's due to them. So 
you know, that's all it. That's the idea, but not, I'm, I'm joking uh, about that. Here are some examples. And what is important, I'll, I'll use my last minute, it's important to emphasize that's a big difference between having a communication to the citizens and a communication with the citizens. And I had to explain to you that, for example, the European money, uh, it's important to show to the, to the people that Europe is in every corner of Europe. In my city, to every two euros paid by our citizens, we brought five euros from European funds to modernize our city. So we have to work from bottom-up perspective to emphasize the European identity and the European project to be stronger, and at the same time, to keep our talents home, because it is a problem in our region of brain drain, so keeping our talents in our country, bring them back from the uh, European Union, it's a must for, for our perspective. But improving the quality of local democracy is one of the key to have them back. I've saved five seconds. Thank you. Uh, you can stay there and then I'll call you there. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor uh, Bock. And uh, um, I, I like in particular the accent that you made um, on uh, youth participation of young people, how they can transfer their knowledge to the old generation. But I liked also in the picture it showed that you really uh, tried to have the participation of young people. And these, I hope, and I, I think it is in your expectation, can help also to keep their inclusion, APOCA, to keep them in Romania and or to attract back those that have left the country. This is a huge problem, not only in Romania, in many other European countries, not only Eastern Europe, but also in some uh, Western European countries. Countries. Thank you very much. And, now, and I have the pleasure to call to the, um, to the board here, uh, President Enrico Rossi of Tuscany, that will tell us about his experience in this beautiful region of Italy. But every region is beautiful in Italy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry for my voice and I'm sorry if I speak Italian. Buongiorno a tutti. Sono lieto di partecipare alla conferenza di oggi. Grazie per partecipare in today's uh, conference and I congratulate you all on choosing such an important topic which is the active involvement of citizens in cohesion policy. I think first and foremost there's a problem of awareness and knowledge on the part of our citizens about the European Union's policy on territory and what advantages there can be for citizens themselves. The regional funds represent a third of the EU's budget, but they do not meet with uh, corresponding appreciation from European Union citizens. Today we're seeing the European Commission paying attention to post-2020 policy decisions, and one of the five priority points is on the topic of creating a Europe which is closer to citizens. The regions very much agree with this priority and we think we can act as a bridge between citizens and the European Union institutions. Now firstly, like the previous speaker, I'd like to talk about the importance of communication. Personally speaking, before the European elections, I committed myself to visiting many projects that were funded in my region by the European Union. I'd very much like to thank the European Commission uh, that came along with me on many occasions and directly participated at the press conferences uh, after these visits. There were, we visited more than 100 projects and that bears witness to the presence of Europe in the Tuscany region. And the outcome of this communication campaign I think met our expectations and even went beyond them. Social network, Facebook, Twitter, radio, TV channels, all reported on our events and followed our progress and the regional TV stations as well also every day uh, had two programs running um, and reached a wide audience and this was an initiative that meant that all people from Tuscany could understand finally what the European Union funds can do to promote development in their own region. Now obviously we told the truth uh, quite often, though we avoid the truth, but we told the truth that those projects were all implemented thanks to funding from the European Union. But it's not just enough to focus on communication. 
we are seeing a crisis of democracy today also because citizens feel like they are being ignored or they're being rejected they're not allowed to participate in everyday public life they're not being consulted or listened to when it comes to political decision making and they want to participate in decision making this crisis in democracy is also something which comes from the fact that democracy has remained anchored in the past in its own institutions it's not very dynamic uh, democracy has stayed the same but the world surrounding us has changed it's become much more complicated so I think that democracy must remain in the hands of the people that are elected to this job but at the same time things do have to change in today's society people that are elected should also try to guarantee that people in society normal people are listened to and perhaps across Europe we need to create a new political ruling class that can really implement this listening role in society and can defend democracy by broadening it. In Tuscany, we've adopted a law on participation, which is based on two main pillars. Firstly, support for local participatory approaches. The law offers support, including financial support, to a whole host of subjects, local authorities, town halls, groups of citizens, schools, but also public, uh, sorry, private companies that want to come up with a participatory initiative on a specific topic. And that process is then uh, handed to an, an independent or neutral third body. Our law is quite similar to the débat public in France. And of course, we need to adapt our region to be able to um, use this possibility. Public debate and discussion in Italy also means that the person who's in charge of this participatory process, whenever the final decision has to be taken, must take into account comments and observations that have been made in the framework of the public consultation. So it is an information process, it's a process where people can discuss and compare ideas and I can assure you that many projects thanks to this process have been improved by the inclusion of citizens, even those citizens that were against these projects because they've been able to provide very relevant and useful input. So the law, this new law, doesn't oblige uh, the parties to accept the response to the consultation but they must take that response into account and the final say of course is still in the hands of the elected representatives. We have also come up with something that we've called a jury of citizens in Tuscany. Here we're talking about 100 or 150 citizens that are asked a specific question. We give them all of the necessary information and then they take a decision. And we've had some very interesting results, also some very innovative proposals as well that have been made to the uh, elected assemblies. And then recently, we started asking citizens that are released from hospital about their experience in hospital a kind of uh, quality assessment, if you like, and then we pass that on. Before coming here to this conference, I wondered whether this kind of thing might not be adopted also for European policies. Just, just to give you an example, agriculture. Why don't we hear from the beneficiaries? Let's ask their opinion on the policies that we make and implement, and then the European policymakers and the European bureaucracy can take that feedback on board and take responsibility then for that feedback when they make their decisions. And then on cohesion policy, on the basis of the partnership and governance model, we also have consultations. We're particularly convinced that 
involving stakeholders in defining strategies is extremely important because this, first of all, will guarantee a good knowledge of the problem, transparency, and it also helps to strive for compromise and to help uh, bring diverging positions closer together. And according to an independent body, the Fondazione Etica, who's here present today at this conference as well, has said that Tuscany, on the basis of the outcome that, that we've seen, and comparing us to other regions, has said that our practices are a very good example of cooperation amongst institutions and citizens, and that this model is something that we have presented also to DG Regio and the World Bank. And there are other examples across Europe as well. I'm thinking about the cohesion uh, ombudsman. They deal with problems that citizens raise when they feel discriminated against. And that's also another good example that could be taken as inspiration and extended uh, in other sectors and in other areas and regions of the EU. In Italy, we have a citizen's watchdog or ombudsman. That, could, that figure could be uh, defined better and his or her role could be strengthened more as well. And I think that we could perhaps launch a practice to identify the best practices that exist already today in Europe when it comes to participatory democracy and how to involve citizens in cohesion policy. And then those best practices could be used as pilot projects in other regions. I very much believe that these projects are extremely important for the future of our union. Thank you very much. Attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Rossi. Uh, I will continue in, uh, in English. Um, I would like to highlight that um, uh, I have appreciated very much what you said about the importance of communicating well about the results of cohesion policy. Somebody already said it, highlighted it in the morning, and I think it's important that, um, that citizens and that public opinion is informed about what comes out, what are the results of the cohesion policy. But to make a link also the general theme of the, of the conference today, I think it is important that we give more and more of a role to citizens to communicate about the results of the projects that they are beneficiaries of. And we have, we've already started to do this in DG Regio, but I think if it is the beneficiaries themselves, the citizens themselves, that can be empowered to talk and to say about what they have experienced, about the advantage that they've seen, I think it would be a very effective communication. And also, I would like to highlight from what you said that um, uh, you, in, in, the, in the experience that you have, um, um, you've, uh, you've um, explain to us that you've done in Tuscany, uh, I think you've put, uh, you've given a practical example of, again, another thing that was said in the morning, which is, I think it was from Transparency International, that we have to aim for a citizen, particip citizen participation beyond speeches. We have to aim at representation without and beyond paternalism and democracy beyond elections. So democracy and citizens' participation should continue, continue also beyond the moment of the election and their participation at elections. So thank you very much to these two speakers.